Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Recite. This is the September 3rd, 2019 edition. Um, we've been doing this a while, and it's a whole lot of fun, and it's really fun to see a whole bunch of people here tonight, some who are new to doing this, which is great, and some who are returning after not having been here a while, which is also awesome. Um, so before we really get started, Jenny Grant has something she would like to say. your um, PSA portion of the evening. Um, I wanted to let you all know, both Macy and I are members of the Woodstock Rotary Club, and on October 12th, we'll be having our annual penny sale. And we do that to raise funds for local charities. We support over 40 local charities in the area, including the Woodstock Library with grants, um, Norman Williams Public Library with grants. Um, and so I have with me tonight um, raffle tickets for the grand prizes. So I would love it if some of you would consider um, buying one or a book of raffle tickets. They're $5 a piece or five for $20. Um, there's some fantastic prizes. Uh, there's a kayak. There's one of those um, Yeti coolers, which are really amazing. Um, there's $1,000 cash is the grand prize. And all the prizes are donated. So the money that you give for the raffle tickets all goes to charity. Um, there's a beautiful diamond necklace with a, in a snowflake pattern. Um, Macy, help me out. What am I forgetting? Anyway, they're on the ticket. So there's additional prizes as well. So I hope that you'll consider um, buying a, a one or a book of raffle tickets to support the library. You can do that during the break raffle. Thank you. And yes, the Rotary is amazing. You guys do amazing things. It's really fun. Um, OK, I have, sometimes I bring poetry to do, but today I have absolutely nothing. <laughs> so um, I've just so been. speak to us poetically then? Of course, yeah, yes. <laughs> um, I think we'll start in with our first Jenny, which since you are all like ready to go, would you like to be the first or would you rather go a little later? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't read that little parenthetical thing. <laughs> You're the only one who has one and I didn't read it. I'm sorry. So why don't we start with somebody who's always ready to just get up and go ahead and do whatever needs to be done. Bob? You don't want this to be done. You don't want to Seriously, be at the beginning? Not, not today. Where in the list do you want to be? Wherever beginning you want. of second half, anywhere Middle except here. But not today with this one. Okay. No. All right. We'll try again. Um, I like it that this group is so like comfortable and easy and we can do this <laughs> sort of thing. Pliable. <laughs> Pliable. <laughs> Easy in different sorts of ways. There's a lot of different versions. Um, we're not going to go there. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Richard Esty will go first. Thank you. <laughs> Since it wasn't here last month. That's right. You've got to catch up. Penalty. Penalty. <laughs> of course, you might want to all leave after I read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't get here, but I did. My, my, hopefully my poems all have a theme of education or going to school. So continuing education in August was visiting the Emily Dickinson Homestead in Amherst. We'd gone there once before, but didn't take the tour. This time we took the tour. One of the sort of the fun things on the tour, if if you haven't been, is that you know you go in one of the rooms and they have this little thing where they have a poster of her you know, enlarged poem where she, around the edges, she put in words that were first, second, third choice in certain lines. And you have to you discuss this, to, well, which one would you choose? Or which one do you think uh, 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 would be the best if you, if you had a chance to, so sort of um, doing her revision, I guess you would say. So, uh, so the first one, I'm going to recite is the most recent poem of hers that I've memorized, which is I Died for Beauty, number 449 in the Thomas Johnson um, edition. I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. He questioned softly, why I fail for truth 
And for beauty, I replied, and I for truth, themselves are one, we brethren are, he said. And so, as kinsmen met a night, we talked between the rooms until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Oh. <laughs> Get a, getting the moss, you, you know, you see all these old gravestones with the moss all covering the names, you can be able to read them, so inside, lips are covered as well. Okay, okay the, the um, first one I'm reading is um, called Higher Education. It's by Jeffrey Harrison, whose father was also a poet. And this, I found this in the um, Best American Poetry for 2017. I just read Best American Poetry for 2018 and didn't find one to memorize, but that's probably my problem, not theirs. But anyway, this is from 2017, and it's called Higher Education. Antioch, Berkeley, and Columbia were the ABCs of colleges my father said he wouldn't pay for. <laughs> Breeding ground for radicalism, he called them, as if their campuses were giant petri dishes spawning toxic cultures. Our own pathology was pretty toxic at the time, both of us stubborn, stubbornly refusing to learn anything about each other or about ourselves, for that matter, stuck in a rudimentary pattern of defining ourselves as opposites. I wouldn't even look at Kenyon, his beloved alma mater, despite its long tradition as a school for future poets. I hadn't read a word of Robert Lowell or James Wright yet, but I had read Ginsburg, and the first stop on my college tour was Columbia. And that's where I ended up going. And my father, to his credit, must have seen that it was the right place for me, or at least unavoidable. So he let me go, and he paid for it. And the only price I had to pay was when I was home on holidays to suffer his barbed commentary about the very education he was financing which ironically had to do with the core values of Western civilization. I can't remember, is forgiveness one of them? We both got a C in forgiveness, but later bumped it up to a B minus, when in a surprising twist, my son ended up at Kenyon. My father took real pleasure in that, though he was already dying by then. I thought of him at graduation, how proud he would have been for his grandson, who, he might have joked, was a better student than he had ever been. All our ignorance put aside, at least, for one day of celebration. Probably one of the reasons that poem caught my attention is our younger daughter went to Kenyon. Okay, the next one is Of Politics and Art by Norman Duby. Norman Dewey was born in Barrie, Vermont, 1945. He now lives in the American Southwest, I think maybe Arizona. And this is from the book American Hybrid, which is a book the library has, and for a number of years it was lost in the children's section. Someone had misfiled it. And Catherine was down there one day saying, you know, some of the poetry books in the children's section seem more like adults. So we got this one out and brought it up, and they said, Oh, it's lost. It's not in the circulation. So they re they re added it to the circulation. I've taken out I've taken out three times. I haven't gotten all the way through yet, but Doobie of course is in near the first part of the alphabet, so I uh, in that first section I found one that I like. And question. How many of you in elementary school, if you went to a public elementary school, um, had prayers? Anybody? Mm. Nobody? Se semi prayer. Were they mantras then? <laughs> I, I distinctly remember in seventh grade we had um, a teacher who had us read a portion, a selection from the Bible, and a little devotional every morning, and we said the Lord's Prayer before we did the uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. So listen to this one carefully, and you'll notice because it, it, the title is of politics and art. Here on the farthest point of the peninsula, the winter storm off the Atlantic shook the schoolhouse. Mrs. Whittemore, dying of tuberculosis, said it would be after dark before the snowplow and the bus would reach us. 
she read to us from Melville, how in an almost calamitous moment of sea hunting, some men in an open boat suddenly found themselves at the still and protected center of a great herd of whales, where all the females floated on their sides while their young nursed there. The cold, frightened whalers just stared into what they allowed was the ecstatic lap lapidary pond of a nursing cow's one visible eyeball, and they were at peace with themselves. Today, I listen to a woman say that Melville might be read in the next decade, and another woman asks, and why not? The first responded, because there are no women in his one novel. Yeah. Mrs. Whittemore was now reading to us from the Psalms. Coughing into her handkerchief, snow above the windows, there was a blue light on her face, breasts, and arms. Sometimes a whole civilization can be dying peacefully in one young woman in a small heated room with 30 children, wrapped, confident, and listening to the pure, God-rendering voice of a storm. Now I'll afflict you with my own rendition of what I call nursery rhyme memoir. I was not nimble. I was not quick. This was no ordinary candlestick, but a floral British heirloom lit by a large wooden match, then placed for all to see on the tiled floor at the front of the classroom. Only one child would be asked to bring this nursery rhyme to life. Who would get the honor? Who would be called to be Jack? Maybe Ian, the minister's son, or Kathy Q, whose last name began like Quick. It could be Tommy, his mother, the town clerk, or Donnie, his dad worked the roads, or maybe Ralph, his mother substitute taught, or Peter, is his dad an attorney, or one who could not read nor write, had never been read a nursery rhyme a bedtime or daytime story. Surely I would not be asked to show off in front of the class. Was Miss Smith saying my name? My shy feet slowly shuffled to the front of the classroom as our teacher led in recitation. I positioned myself ready to jump. We had already sung about the cow who jumped over the moon to the delight of her barnyard buddies. My vaulting leap was ardent, but sadly, only one soaring stardom moment when I utterly believe that the cow easily jumped over the moon to the tune of Fiddle and Spoon. Outside at recess, I found a quiet corner where, like little Jack and his thumb, I could escape into my own world I've never told a soul till now the ecstasy of the light of that leap. My unfeeling family's feet were too heavy for candlelight. Thank you. Thank you. Melville? No. No, Doobie? Doobie. I, if we don't, we can get them through interlibrary loan. We can get anything through interlibrary loan, so. What's that? We are all powerful. We can get anything through interlibrary loan, as long as it's at least six months old. Then we're all powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's a secret. I can't tell you that. Okay. Um, let's see. Anne Schaffmaster, would you like to go next? Um, 
um, as always, I will read two poems. Um, the first poem is called Death on a River. Can everyone hear me? No. Oh, you went up? OK. Death on a River. He is a man now, full grown, tattoo of a lady up and down one arm, silver hoops in his nipples, and one in his tongue. An archangel, my golden-haired son. Drugs and alcohol, this school and that one. Car wrecks, gas station jobs, another week gone. Riverman, adventurer, copycat Icarus to the sun. World-class rapids, something else to be done. No sense ever of the shadow to come. Colorado, Saturday, early a.m. Bachelor's party, liquor and high spirits all around. Bone tired, excited, anticipation of fun. Hell's Kitchen, beauty with thorns. The river runs without conscience. It cares for no one. Frigid water, hydraulics, and boulders. The last dinner for some. Hook in the eye, hook in the throat. Danger, an aphrodisiac beyond anything else he knows. Enlightenment, who can say no? Survivor's guilt, banged up and bruised. Mouthfuls of water and fear, raw and crude. One man dead, heart attack. He did not drown. My son was his guide. It seems neither lived long. Um, the next poem is called Luxury Hotel. Oh, my son, resting now on your unmade bed. Cold metal shines like my mother's Sunday silverware once did. How I hated to polish the spoon I used after eating an egg. Like an egg you hatched, only to fall from the nest, broken in half, one piece mine, the other your dad's, with nothing left for you. A red ribbon wraps your torso, a surprise gift from Santa Claus. When did the Budweiser girl on the outside of your arm replace Star Wars and G.I. Joe? Blue-gray toes curl beneath the light white sheet. Nine fingers, not ten. Did you feel bone snap, or were you already dead by then? It's always the mother's fault, yet you smiled up at me when you slipped from my womb. If I had been perfect, would you not have been the boy who thought cars could sail? At your birth, I howled at the moon while neighbors in rocking chairs drank cold lemonade on screened-in porches to keep vigil until dawn. Remember my catching you as you jumped into the pool, those endless flights of happiness and small fears. My arms ached while my mind, yes, wandered in the juncture of boredom and love convened. Did you fight for your life, my son? And tell me now, where is it that you have gone? And will you come back to me soon? And tell me now, when did this ending first begin? If indeed life is a circle, might we travel backwards some? Might I read to you in bed, my sliced up one? How you snuggle, the boy of then, as your bloodless mouth slaps me in the face again and again. Of course you can see me still. Under your closed eyelids, you say, go to hell. Forgiveness does not exist in this luxury hotel. Whenever I hear your poems, I want to like go back and read them three more times. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, hi, Sandy. Let's see. Peter Fox Smith, would you like to go next?
Thank you. I have five poems to share with you. The first is entitled Blockflöte, which many of you know as a recorder. Oh, how he made that piece of wood sing, fingers and thumb covering, uncovering the whole so fast there was a blur. Presto trills to fermata pause. Key change, major to minor. Now largo tempo. Tone, piano. A low C sustained so long all the breath of the world was extinguished. Melpomene, goddess of music, stood applauding, but Orpheus showed some concern. A little bit of wood, handheld, hollow with holes, an air column whittled through, thus transmogrified into sterling songs. Wood thrushes, house wrens, viris, acknowledging one of their own. Always alone, or so it seems, the piper pipes his melodies dawn to dusk, or perhaps a whole night through to a waning ego ill world, food and drink abating, ears stopped to the piper's tunes in a wafting homeward through eons to Lyra, merely 236.5 trillion kilometers from our gouging of Mother Earth. She sheds no tear, is unaware of her own pain. Second one is a chirping bird by twilight sings. A chirping bird by twilight sings of evening grays now giving way to nocturnal things in sway with arcane shifts that somehow swings into a cloudy night grown black, devouring guilty mortal greeds dug deep, where no good supersedes those ego jolts, a constant rack of agonies, anguishes we mindlessly neglect during games we play. But poetry slams shame no one Prizes, fun, night of glee in wonderful, quaint old Vermont of we're great again, USA. Just don't be female, black, poor, gay in wonderful old USA. Or speak ill of our commandant in his White House flooding with lies. No global warning days of doom, no extinctions arriving soon. But should we suffer Earth's demise, we'll just pitch our tents on the moon. Third one is entitled, The Four of Us. Mother, mausoleum, father, pine box, brother, ashes in a jar, three spent, kinetic me, aged 84, reaper calling, 
Peter, come. My psyche says no, not ready to go. One is life and one is breath with barely a breath between. Vulgaris. What's alive won't live long. Even the stars do die. Our puny life of come and go, unnoticed by moon or sun. To other hands we give ourselves to each to hold, more fragile than a flower capricious as some fleeting fancy, gentle yet firm as if it is all we have of this once luxurious land of tree and stream, of certain yet fast fading dreams where dear look then leap from human sound and scent, where long ago was said, we're lucky, but now curse our woes, stamping feet, shake of fist, fretting evil times, think unworthy thoughts, and glibly chide, what the fuck? Last one, Hamlet, a hermit for our time. Hiding high in the hills in his hut of a home, Hamlet is happy far from noxious noises, from hustling hostilities, from huffy heedless hordes of inhumanity. How'd you like all that onomatopoeia? which dominates in the stanza just read. I think it's enough for now, though. Here and there, a trifle more may creep in as our story continues. Oh, also, I meant to ask if you are aware each stanza has seven lines and every line has six syllables. It is such precision which I like is what brings me pleasure when I write. Differing meters and rhyming makes composing poems an intriguing conundrum to attempt to resolve. And especially now at this time when scansion, indeed when the art of versification is considered obsolete by many who assume they are poets making poetry, Perhaps not. Merely, they are writing prose placed on a page to resemble poems. Prose and poetry differ. Poems are made of types, dramatic, lyric, of rhymes, rhythms, stressed and unstressed, of meters, iambic, trochaic, anapests, often with rhymes making poetry musical, and of course, forms, couplets, tercets, quatrains, stanzas of many different sorts. For example, rhyme royale, the Spenserian, or the Shakespearean, the Atavarima, odes, villanelles, sestinas, clever limericks, free verse of irregular forms. <gasps> My time's expired, so please forgive my tangent, thus leaving a happy Hamlet in his hot home, all alone, hiding high in the hills, his terse tale still waiting to be told. That was wonderful.
John O'Connor, would you like to go next? Sorry for the air. We will turn the air conditioning back on at break when it won't interfere with us hearing what's going on. And then there's also um, refreshments that Yash brought. John O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the lecture. <laughs> You'll have to search for the form in these. It's there. I'll start out with this one called uh, Lanterns. Those stars across the yard from the porch are not part of any galaxy. I have hung them aloft from trees that were hewn years ago when one lonely house was coming down and a new one was being built. We love to play the little god, don't we? With our hammer in one hand and a sandwich in the other. Then the rains fall suddenly and hard in the middle of a sweltering summer and we think everything will be okay. Building a trellis for the stars takes time. You need your coffee break, your crumpets, your wife you found in England when she thought for one brief moment she loved something real. But we know the universe keeps up its pace and the black holes have their contests with those violent fires on the other side of tomorrow are only a string of lights tonight. A mystery suspended above, we only need to turn our heads upward to enjoy. Love, sit next to me on the porch. Don't say anything for now. Let us create worlds made of silence and launch them into the night where they will stay for as long as memory holds its fading ink. Thank you. Um, so I, I sort of think of um, the two sides of passion being ecstasy and tragedy, uh, which is why I love Fado music. And this poem comes from a, uh, a trip uh, that I took to Lisbon when I was 65, a young man. <laughs> it's called Fado Black. My wife took me to Lisbon for my birthday. Imagine it was in her generous days, but it still counts even now. I went for Fado and wine. She went there to make love, not necessarily to me. She rented a flat on the fifth floor in the city's heart with a balcony as thin as a cigarette. And there I smoked my one a day, watching the city move beneath me while she slept in a room that seemed a continent away. Her suitors wore the black attire you see in the bars that murdered so many over the decades with love. Then the revolution came and like a lover wounded by passion, it died too. I heard her dream one night. Music drifted from her room on a breeze, but there was no musician within blocks and no radio near her. When I came to bed, she murmured anxiously, words without vowels, only vibrations deep in her throat, her mouth remaining softly closed. This is a story, you will say, not a poem but I will argue with you, like I did the waiter who stiffed me for the brandy while the singers competed with their songs of fate. He spoke no English and I no Portuguese. Our voices rose with the crescendo of the song. Everyone heard us speaking the universal language of passion, hearts beating to a smoky rhythm, our brains sitting by the shadowed wall and straight back chairs, calmly watching, aware of the missing change. 
lying on the floor. I'll read a couple more. Um, I have a friend uh, who's been my friend for a very long time. She lives in Iowa. And um, this poem comes from a journey <clears throat> that I took when I was a really young man. And she was uh, living in Vermont, up near the Canadian border, working in a sweatshop, a seamstress, as a seamstress. It's called, I Never Thought to Ask. How it was to handle the material as the machine dragged the cloth edge and your tiny fingers toward the biting needle. Or how you got on all day, the only English speaker in the middle of a sweatshop full of Quebecois. Did they go home and write poems about you or wonder who you were with, when their husbands pulled out their fiddles to scratch the bows across their grandparents' storylines. You went home each night to that storefront you made into an apartment where Turtle and I slept on the floor after we showed up to rescue you. I, end up, I ended up working at the top of a ladder where the ends fused together as if to tell me there was no way out. Macintosh for as far as you could see. The school kids went back to the books, and the foreman begged me to stay until the migrants showed from Jamaica. Their voices were joyous, and I complained about the pay. I never thought to ask you if you wanted to leave. It was written all over you, so I caught a bus to Portland, you thinking I'd never come back. Under a statue of Hawthorne, I looked for work in the paper with a headline that Allende had fallen. We knew something of the world, that it could only get worse. What happened to that communal garden we were going to grow? The big kitchen, the big table, the big vat that would slow cook the best there was for everyone. We rented the first floor of the house on Cumberland Avenue, kitty corner from the Italian grocer, where the children jumped rope and sang, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. The winter was coming, and eight-cylinder sedans lined up to gang rape the Sinclair dinosaur while we watched the price of oil empty our pockets. I never thought to ask you whether you saw it as a rescue or a kidnapping, my turning up like that. It was the last state of the Union, and there was nowhere else to go. Canada? I don't think so. Even the war wouldn't make me go there. I hated America, but she was my mother. Never thought to ask what the ransom or reward was worth to you. Or if I asked, you never answered. Just sat across from me in that big stuffed chair, crocheting, eating pistachios, and begging the question. And I'll read uh, one more. Uh, this is from my book, Half the Truth which is on sale at the Yankee Bookshop. Uh, those poems are recent over the last few months. Um, I'm going to read one poem from, um, from uh, a scene from 10 years ago when I went to visit Maine. And um, see if I can find it. It's called Morning on Crockett Cove. Crockett Cove is on Deer Isle. <clears throat> Across the cove, two men digging for clams. The gulls make their nasty remarks and follow behind one of the clamors who thrashes the mud with his short rake. I'm watching them from the porch of a rented house hidden behind the pines. I pick up my field glasses for a better look. I love work. I can watch it all day. One of them stands up, stretches. The way his hand moves away from the rake, I know he's going for a cigarette. Bingo. He fetches the match from a shirt pocket. The day is gray as a heron's wing. 
Soon the man is smoking and his free hand moves to his crotch and a stream of piss is splashing in the mud. He's looking in every direction, sucking on a cigarette, peeing like there's no tomorrow. Thank God, I'm thinking, feeling his relief. Glasses still up to my eyes. His back must be killing him. How much can he get for those clams anyway? I want to slog over there and hand him every bit of my vacation money for his bucket and tell him to go home. But no, the time's not right. Never will be. And besides, he's having a fine moment, as good as any he'll ever have, pissing in the mud and smoking in the rank wet air of low tide. Thanks. Thanks, John. So that book, Half the Truth, do we have it here at the library? Do you know? We should. I'll check. Awesome. Yes. I'll talk to the book buyer. We'll, we'll, we'll get you set up. Um, all right, let's see. Geza, would you like to go next? All right. It's really nice to be back here at Recite. I missed many sessions during the summer. Um, I'll start out by reading a couple of poems appropriate for this season. The first one's from my first collection, Cello Tears, and I'd written a number of poems called Autumnal Question, four of them, and this is just the second one. <clears throat> so it's called Autumnal Question 2. What clouds there, all dressed in black, solemn pallbearers marching to a funereal rhythm, this dying heartbeat of life, this pounding silence that sounds as summer's softness passes. Yet those trees there on the shore, crowding, teeming, so alive, frocked in happy colors, could they just be ghouls in guise, mocking this advanced season and rejoicing at life's death? That pink on the horizon and that lapis blue above, those chameleon colors, golds and greens and oranges, are they just the fireworks that mark the end of all life? The next uh, season appropriate poem is from the second volume, or my third collection, Extinction, um, and it's called Fallen Leaves. Fallen leaves tango in the street with whirling dust that tears the eyes. Rustle with the strains of the wind, announcing the advent of fall. And I shiver as I follow in their wake toward the winter, from which there is no more waking. My poems are generally fairly short, so I'll read a few of them. Uh, the, the next one uh, I'll read because we're, we all know there's this terrible storm out there that's plaguing a lot of people in um, the southeast and Bahamas, and it's called Storm. Menacing lightning zigzags across the sky. Thundering hoofs of hell trample the beaten earth. Torrential rain washes our hu human filth away. Um, my friend Jim is here, and he's a fabulous chef. And he knows how much I love food. <laughs> and uh, I wrote a little haiku. I, I write many haiku, haikus, and this is one call, haiku aren't supposed to have titles, but I call it garlic love. My wife says I use too much garlic in my sauce. I peel one more clove. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of reading, uh, doing a recital with Peter at, in Montpelier at Poem City. And um, he read a few of my poems, I read a few of his poems, and it, it was a wonderful occasion for me. 
But Peter read uh, this uh, poem, and uh, since he's here, I'll read it again, because he said he liked it. It's called Like Romeo. Like Romeo, I yearn to cling to you, my Juliet, lust for your silken touch, your sensual kisses, your soft voice. I cherish this love that defies the void, the shrieking black hole of our loneliness in this empty temporal universe. The existence devouring solitude imposed by those perverse, perverted gods, the false idols that dare to cheat our hopes, the one solace, our chase after that look, the caress, the shared pleasures that affirm that for this moment on this spinning globe, at least we are alive and not alone. Thank you of all yours. That's my absolute oh, favorite. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Superb poem. Thank, thank you. I'll read a few new poems. Um, I'm, I'm working towards a, an, an extinction, too, so these will hopefully go into that. Um, the first one is, we exist in four dimensions. We exist in four dimensions. That is, at least we think we do. Where time ticks relentlessly by, and we mortals bulge into space until the black hole hijacks us and our world simply expires. The next one is called, We Just Cower in the Cellar. Drought cracks the soil, withers our crops. Fires burn our forests, scorch our fields. Gale force winds scour the landscape. Drenching rain and the rising seas flood our towns, wash away the coast. Mudslides bury whole villages. The blighted earth is fighting back and frightened at what we have done, we just cower in the cellar. A short little poem called Perfected Rapture. Hearing Yo-Yo Ma play the six Bach cello suites, I float toward heaven in perfected rapture. Um, I, I, I loosely have a series of poems, which I call my beastie poems. So the next one is one of those. It's called The Chiding Cricket. I was dozing spread-eagled on the grass when a cricket catapulted onto my cro crotch, wiggled its an antenna and chided me, admonishing me for mankind's folly. Yes, the brazen creature took me to task for our uncaring, polluting lifestyle, our devastation of its habitat. I had nothing to say in our defense. Another uh, beastie po poem called Pollination. A bumblebee buzzes by the bee bomb, seeking the blossom's sweet nectar to suck with its protracted straw-like proboscis. Inadvertently, it picks up pollen, brushes it into its cor cor corbicula, packing the fine dust and the propolis with the pollen pressed on its hind legs. When the bee alights on the next flower, some of the golden powder brushes off on the fertile pistil's sticky stigma, completing magical pollination. Next summer's sun will bring forth new blossoms, and bumblebees will pollinate yet again, unless, unless our polluting poisons devastate their dwindling population. One more beastie poem called A Rafter of Wild Turkeys. A rafter of wild turkeys frolics in the field some toms and hens, young jakes and jennies, a few pults. The birds strut and prance, then go peeking and poking. They halt for a moment at the side of the road, and in a burst, vault out onto the macadam, 
hightailing it across the dangerous divide. Relief, they have made it, even the smallest chick. Bravo, say I, rooting for the rafter to live. But in my gut, I, the glutton, think to myself, would that meaty hen not have made a tasty meal? And uh, just one more haiku. Uh, we all know about the opi opioid crisis. So this is called the pills. Pills can prolong life, even improve it for some, or just end it all. So with that, I'll end it all. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so we will end this first half with Jennifer Grant, and then we'll take a little intermission, um, at which time you're welcome to partake of the wonderful treats that Yash has brought, and we'll turn on the air conditioner, and then we'll come up with the second half. But for now, Jennifer Grant. Um, so this is a poem that I wrote on the Saturday after September 11th, um, and since we're once again approaching that date, um, in our nation's history, um, I brought it with me tonight. Um, I read it in church the day after, the Sunday, um, the day after I read it. And at that time, we were still all hoping um, that the um, first responders might somehow be magically found in some huge air pocket, which they all survived. So um, there's a line about the heroes called away that you'll hear that I added later. September 11th, copyright Jennifer Grant, 2001. Workers at their tasks, travelers on their way, while the sun shone bright and the children played on the darkest, darkest day. From first fiery crash, the world then changed, for the force of hate took their lives away on the darkest, darkest day. A city's pride turned a pile of gray. Our nation stunned the Pentagon aflame on the darkest, darkest day. Frantic calls of are you okay? The loss of heroes duty called away on the darkest, darkest day. United we stand Remembering that day, we will rise again, the free and the brave. And when we can cry, together we pray for never a darker, darker day. Thanks very much. Intermission. Okay. Welcome back. So one thing I forgot to say before, because I forgot to bring it out, was the book that we have here. Um, we have this book that we bring out every month, and it's, it's a nice little um, record of what we do here. And so each month when we do this, I, anyone who would like to is welcome to put their names in the book. You can write whatever you want. You can write the poems or the poets or just comments, whether you read or not or whatever, just um, just something, little something about tonight. Um, you're welcome to do that. And you can flip back through the other ones and see what other people have done if you like. Um, so this is really fun. We have a lot of people here tonight. We have 12 poets. So, um, so we are going to start the second half with a poet songwriter, Sandy Anderson. Been wonderful so far. Thank you. Oh, here. Okay. Red ribbon. She wore a red ribbon in her hair. It was a mirror of her care. The ribbon, made into a bow, had tails extended softly 
in rows dangling down her neck just above her breast that blanketed her heart. It was red and reflected life and promise, promises yet to share. What she wants is to be wanted, always to be free, and from that beauty to dig in deep. She's on the ground and in the air all at once, a heart to keep. How much of our lives are we candid and true? Is what I show myself what I show you? I'd like them to be one and the same. The honesty and self-love can shine through our name. We'd be better off naked, starting there. No one is the same when we lay it all bare. If we get a little closer to opening up and giving our true self a place to step out in our living, we can be reflective and quiet, ill at ease or outspoken, poetic, gracious, wise, or open. If we spend less time on what others think, we might relax more as their opinions shrink. The discomfort of thinking we are not good enough in our looks, our actions, our work, and our stuff can be traded in for feelings of peace in spirit, in body, in all we release. The sun will shine into dark, curious places in our undealt with fears and all of life's phases. Soak it all in and enjoy what you feel being you, your true self, and all that is real. I think of these as assignments, <laughs> and especially ones that turn into songs. I just listen and follow directions. This one is called Heroes' Ways. Sorry, I'm blocking everything from behind here, but that's the best I can do, I guess. This growl down below is a C note, so I turn my string down really low, and it uh, makes a whole C chord with a nice bass note. But it also growls a little. You can feel the waves of the tone. Where are you going? 
you know that from outside looking in, we believe in you. We fill up our hearts with the love that you
Have we reached the point in the evening where you are able to do your surgery? Mm -hmm. We'll see. Okay, give it a try, see what happens. So I only got one thing to read today. If I can get through it at all. It is still clumsy, rough and a work in progress. Uh, and cause I go through this every year when 9-11 rolls around. Because way back then, you can guess where I live. Manhattan. And this time, this year, I tried to write some words down. Some thoughts about it all, though no words ever suffice. No jokes tonight. Please bear with me. It's called New York, New York. Like the song. I was there. I was there sitting in my apartment. 63rd and Madison, finishing breakfast, leftover coffee, around nine in the morning, watching the news as usual. When I saw something impossible on TV, right in front of me in real time, that just couldn't be happening, couldn't be real. Two planes, not one, two, one right after the other, exploding, crashing right into the Twin Towers downtown, World Trade Center, tallest buildings in the world. Black smoke and fire were bursting out all over. And then I saw what looked like tiny, dark, stick-like specks falling out of the sky. Till I realized unbelievably they were people. People jumping out of the windows. Both buildings were suddenly gone, collapsed crumbled to the ground just three or four miles downtown. It was dark everywhere. Burning clouds over all. Panic and the smell of fear. They closed all exits out of the city. Subways, buses, cars going nowhere. Huge crowds huddled in the streets. I didn't know whether to dare go down and look around or stay inside and hide. Nobody knew what was going on. Figured this was it, the end. Suddenly, out of nowhere, goodbye America, the world, and all the rest.
Back then, if and when I ever got out alive, decided to leave all the cities of my life. You know the rest. Live out the dream. Snow white and green. Pristine Vermont. So here I am, 18 years later, an old man now, watching the news as usual, finishing breakfast, leftover coffee around nine in the morning, and another shooting just now reported in some little kid's school right up here in God's country, somewhere over the rainbow. And I sing to myself, what a wonderful world. Pennies from heaven, just next door. Thanks for listening. Who wants to follow that? Let's see. Corey? Corey Cook. Okay. I'm going to read two of my own and then... Um, a third by Stephen Dunn. <clears throat> this first one is called Resuscitation Annie, which I don't know if everybody knows that that's the CPR doll. I don't know if that sort of standard knowledge or not, but my dad was on the um, volunteer, he was a volunteer fireman, and he brought Resuscitation Annie home in a duffel bag one night, and I was horrified. <laughs> so, I've actually written about her several times. <laughs> Resuscitation Annie. I happened on her in a dream, lying on the floor, all rubber and collapsible chest, just a torso, neck, and head, her eyes shut, lips parted. She needed me to breathe for her. I fell to my knees, tilted her head back, pinched her nose, and exhaled into her mouth. I then started the compressions. I did this over and over, breathing and pumping, pumping and breathing, but I could not resuscitate the girl with no limbs, the girl with the eyelids for eyes. She kept taking from me, and I kept giving. I should have known better. She had no lungs, no heart to jump start. I finally gave up and rested my sweaty cheek on her chest, only to be woken by someone's breath on the back of my neck. Um, the second one is Triptych, a Grandmother. One, waving a wet hand towel at a deer in her vegetable garden, a doe with bulging eyes, a doe that raises her white flag, surrenders. Two, sitting at her dining room table, hands clasped, smiling at her grandchildren who peer into the dark turkey carcass and drink strawberry milk. Three, sucking on a red popsicle, lips stained and cracked, cheeks sunken, voice waning, consumed as she sits in the bloated black leather chair. All right. 
Um, and this poem by Stephen Dunn is from Lou Strife, uh, and it's called Solving the Puzzle. I couldn't make all the pieces fit, so I threw one away. No expectation of success now, none of that worry. The remaining pieces seemed to seek their companions. A design appeared. I could see the connection between the overgrown path and the dark castle on the hill. Something in the middle, though, was missing. It would have been important once. I would not have been able to sleep without it. Thanks. Thanks. So let's see. Yash, would you like to go next? Sure. Yash Dembinski, the founder of Recite. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Well, and you know, I, I, uh, I, I realized, because a friend of mine was talking about the, the cribbage club she started, and she said, oh, people are doing all sorts of things. And I thought, uh, and, and my friend is who, who um, owns a company, he's married to her, and uh, he says, you know, in my leadership position, I feel I have to serve. I'm always, I'm wondering, every interaction I have, how can I serve? And, and he, he has a wonderfully successful business, and, and that's really what it's about. And I realize I've been kind of hogging the, the service. I've been bringing this stuff for the past four or five times. And so if anybody would like to... Um, relieve you of the service. Huh? If anyone would like to relieve you of the service, if you could take a break. Well, I, I don't have to. No, I can continue. It's a joke. It's a joke. Okay. I thought you said no jokes this evening. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, without, without further ado... Uh, um, all right, I'm going to read a chapter and a half of Fair, uh, Moses in Israel, and then um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, my, my real key uh, habit is just getting worse and worse. <laughs> so, all right, here it is. The day had come to meet Pharaoh. Elders, those who had met with Moses and Aaron, gathered for the crucial meeting. Soldiers of Pharaoh observed them all and passed on word of the unusual gathering. As the elders walked to Pharaoh's palace, more soldiers appeared on the way, watching the procession. Few elders had the grace to accompany Moses and Aaron for long. Before the palace's large doors, Korah bowed with a careful smile, and on the broad porch steps he left them. Servant corps of Pharaoh ushered them into one hall, down another, past a courtyard's garden, past the harem chambers where the royal children were tutored, past guards, a fountain, to the chamber in which Pharaoh might glance down upon the brothers, draped with golden hangings, where incense burnt in abundance like the heart of a strange dark flower. Then, while Moses and Aaron waited, Windows were uncovered. Before their blinking eyes, Pharaoh appeared, seating himself. Billows of incense wafted away. They told lies, I told myself, about the queen mother, how she had saved a Hebrew child, a male, and raised him, though he incensed my father. But now, here he is. So speak, lest I flail you for a crime some have alleged. Thus says, Moses began clearly, the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. Nays were chorused. Pharaoh twice stomped down his rod of state to silence the chamber. That they, Moses spoke out, may celebrate a feast to me in the desert. Really? To play? thought Pharaoh, smirking inwardly. The least a god could do was demand sacrifice. Pharaoh mused further while his counselors abused Moses' demand. What artifice was here? What intrigue? Were there hopeless wars being plotted? Pharaoh answered, 
Who is the Lord that I should heed his plea to let Israel go? So leave it at that. Um, if you want to read the book, you can ask me, and I'll give you a copy. It's still a draft, so uh, that's just the caveat to it. Um, <clears throat> all right, I, I bought a new <laughs> book of Rilke, and um, I've just been savoring it. I was uh, on my trip I had, and there were, oh shit. I just lost, oh no, I know where it is, good. <laughs> I had my page marked there. But um, there's this one poem that I read of his. I said, wow, I wrote this incredibly dramatic poem, at least from, in my opinion. Um, and Rilke has, has captured it in such simpler terms. And I thought I'd just share both poems with you. So the first one is, um, I've recited it here before, but it's, it's uh, The Sacred Valley. Or, yeah, I think that's what I call it. Because it came to me when I visited my daughter in Peru, and we went to the Sacred Valley, and I experienced and was exposed to an awful lot of Incan culture. And the idea, the thought to me that here comes Catholic Spain and wipes, in, wipes out all this beauty, I mean, wipes it out, where... And I, and I had this sense, like, no, it still exists. It still exists somewhere but not in this dimension. And then these words really kind of came to me. Uh, obviously I've polished them up, but it goes like this. I must go into the, to, in order to discover and be one with these Incans. I must go into the valley of death, between the mountains of time and matter, into the blinding light of creation with faith aware in each calmly held breath, within peace no wraith of fear shall shatter. The self vanishes in meditation. Herein I am and I live and I dance, each step, each thought, each feeling in balance, adoring my Lord and God as man, as a star in night's vast heavenly span, as a drifting white cloud in a blue sky. In the running waters, thin fishes ply. In the letters and the words of this poem, in all, everywhere, I shall make my home. And how that gets me to the Incans, I don't know, but hopefully it does a little bit. But it's, a, it's clearly a, a poem about meditation, which surprised me that it became that poem. And and here's the poem I want to share of Rilke's. Um, there's no way I'm going to forget it, just in case I'll turn to the page. So. <clears throat> and it's one of his unpublished poems at the end of his life. He wasn't too interested in publishing. It goes like this. Ah, not to be cut off. Not to be excluded by such slight partition from the star's measure. What is inwardness? What if not sky intensified, flung through with birds and deep with winds of homecoming? So, and my last poem, a Roki poem, because it just knocked me off my feet. And it's, uh, cause it's full of, uh, it's full of purity. It's the only way, I, it's basically my thought. <clears throat> and this is from the second, um, he has 50, this is from the Sonnets of Orpheus, and it's from the second part, uh, and it's the poem number two. I just caught this the other night, I said. Anyway, I haven't memorized it, but. All right, here we go. Just as the master's true stroke is sometimes caught by a nearby page that's quickly seized, so mirrors often take into themselves that one sacred smile of girls 
as they assay the early morning all alone. Or in the glimmer of attendant lights and later into the breath of their actual faces only a reflection falls. Those eyes that stare into the charred slowly dying glow of earth hearths what issues from them life glimpses gone forever ah earth who knows her losses only one who with tones that nonetheless praise sings the heart born into the whole. Thank you. There's a lot of Rilke in that book. <laughs> it's going to take you through a little time there. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good. Um, alrighty, let's see. We have two more people. We'll do Jim and then Mark. So, Jim Ryman. Thank you. It's my first time. Coming out of the, uh, <clears throat> the poetry closet. <laughs> so I, I'm fortunate to live uh, in the country in Barnard and uh, a lot of my poems um, have been inspired by what's in my backyard. This one is called The Black Bear. And it's a true story. In the early spring, on the backside of Chattagui, near my home, the bears come out hungry from under the winter snow. In the fading afternoon noon light, I follow fresh tracks over the frozen brook to a small opening between two trees. And there, something dark and still, a large male, paused and faced me at the edge of the woods. Share your dreams with me, I asked, with my eyes. And his eyes answered, magic exists between us. He inhaled my fear. In the, eerie, in the eerie silence, the conversation continued. I could smell him, and he me. Fear is necessary, his eyes said. It is what holds us in this moment. Feel it and understand its power. In those seconds of silence, I felt strangely safe under the spell of his presence. Then silently, as the last bit of light came between us, he drew his blackness around him like a cloak, and he turned to the woods in the darkness. Stepping into the magic of night, he slowly slipped into the shadows of spruce and hemlock and disappeared, taking with him so much that is still unknown. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, um, is a poem that um, I felt coming to me after I read an article about how vibration um, can cause particles to come together and that out of nothingness, something might happen. It's called Creation Song. There was a sound the other day it came from someplace far away. The sound of a single note so sweetly played on a string from a harp that God has made. Could it be the sound of time begun? That perfect note of only one. That one clear perfect note resound. Joined by other notes until the notes swirl and dance in perfect form. And soon a perfect song is born. A song so sweet night turns to day and the void of darkness is swept away. 
And on and on the notes will play in a rhythm of the cosmos sway. From empty space that song is sung, creation's bells of birth are rung. The nothingness that was before is now creation's song forevermore. Until eternity no longer sings, until the bell no longer rings, until the light of day is gone and notes no longer make this song. This other one is uh, also inspired by my backyard. For 40 years I have walked this land and see the seasons change and the days pile on one another like fallen leaves layer the moist earth. Each new leaf, each new fallen leaf a crumbled page with a story of its own. And while the memory of its time slowly fades and decays, it nourishes the wasting seed below, the waiting seed below. Until the sun and warm spring rain give life, gives life to sprouts that are soon tendrils green. And so begins the cycle of life again. Do I have time for one more? Sure. Okay. Um, the last one. Um, so uh, I started writing poetry in the late 90s. So, um, but I'm terribly slow. So the inspirations come to me in bits and pieces. This one, I happened to be in Guatemala on the day that a volcano erupted, which happened to be the same day that my father died. It's called Pacaya, which is the name of the volcano. On that clear January morning at the beginning of the millennium, Pacaya spoke for my father, his final breath erupting in a thick black cloud rushing towards heaven. I have loved you, my son. Later that day, pure white and brilliant on the black beach of Monterico, just after I wrote a song to my father, a scorpion placed a tiny dagger of death in my back. Betraying the peaceful lyrics of the song so sweet. That night, dark and silent beneath, beneath a thatched roof, I dreamed a terrible dream. My heart beat to the thumping rhythm of the Pacific surf. I screamed the dream of death and felt the blood of my father drain from my body as I awoke abandoned and alone, fatherless in another world. Thank you. Welcome out of the closet to the poetry world. And welcome to the group, and we hope you'll come back again. Like another person who has recently joined us, and it's lovely to have him and see him returning, um, Mark Brown will be our final poet of the night. Hi. So I've shared with a couple of you guys that I've had taken some time off from writing and then recently got started trying to get back into it. And as we know, it's an exercise and it's difficult when you've taken time off and you get out of shape. But one of the things I've done as I've been getting back into it is sort of reflected on, you know, what started my journey. You know, reading old poets that I've really enjoyed and and those who have influenced me. And one that's been on my mind is been my mentor um, she passed away early last year. Um, I met her while attending the New York Summer Writers Program at Skidmore. Uh, she was my instructor and she eventually, and I attended her summer workshops at her home at Cambridge and then eventually attended her graduate program <clears throat> that she was the director of. Um, so I've been reading her stuff and um, just she's been on my mind so I thought I would share one of her poems. Her name is Lucy Brock Broido. Um, and I'm going to read a poem by her called Carpe Demon, um, which was addressed to her friend, the poet Lucy Greeley, who committed suicide in 2002 or 2003. Where's your father whose eyes you were the apple of? Where are your mother's parlor's portiers, her slip-covered days, her petticoats? 
In the orchard at the end of time, you were just a child in ballet slippers. Your first poodle skirt, your tortoise shell barrettes. At the peach tree, as the peach tree grew more scarce each day, you kept running out to try to tape the leaves back on their bows. Once I caught you catch a pond of sunlight in your lap, and when you stood, the sunlight the sunlight spilt. It could never follow you. Once above the river, you told me you were born to be a turtle, swimming down under the bridge. Now you take your meals where the thinnest creatures live at the end of the world. Carpe demon, you told me, just before you put down the phone and drank the antifreeze. This year, the winter sky in Missouri is a kind of cold, the color of a turtle's hood, a soup of dandelion, burdock root, and clay. Now, in an act of extreme masochism or arrogance, I'm going to follow that up with some of my own poems. Um, and last month, I had shared some poems that I had written as part of a series. Um, these are actually all going to be standalone poems. Uh, a day more like the next than like the one before. The sun raises itself tired and unsteady into a sky tilting with the insolence of an uninspired painting. It's a mild day, the temperature of a gentle acid trip as experienced by shy, quietly self-aggrandizing people. I've always admired the way they look at me when they can't think of anything more to say, the way one admires a sword for the damage that it can do. No one's hand. Taking a moment, a thin and lost bird, the color of an unkempt child's oily hair, carefully set both feet firmly on the ground and raised its chilling head back. Its call wasn't proud. Not the sound that raises kings from their deathbeds. It put a tremble in no one's hand. The bird's mother stands in the back of the mind at the sound, shaking her head slowly, back and forth, like a scythe. Worship. I've discovered a new form of worship but still need to find a way to involve the deaf and those with one side shorter than the other. The idea is for you to fold yourself until only your unfettered, as many times as you can, until only your unfettered parts are showing. More primitive forms of this were practiced on the banks of industrial canals and poorly structured countries during birthdays and on the anniversaries of less tragic events by women who at the very end would pose suggestively in the light of their own reflections. In my only sermon, I preach that faith is not just about making excuses for doing whatever we want, but to outdo all other religions three to one. You are unoppressed, but someday I will show you a child's rendering of what my God looks like. What I believe makes me love like an overgrown forest at night. You are there, two mismatched amber eyes approaching from a distance. This next poem I had written a number of years ago, and for the longest time I could not think of a title. I held like three or four titles. And then this past um, Easter, I had started attending my uh, the church that my brother goes to down here, um, a Methodist church. And they had a Thursday night before Easter service. And it's called Tenebrae, uh, which apparently has something to do, it's called a shadow service. I'm not entirely sure, but it just seemed to perfectly fit this poem. It's time for the trees to shed their motley coats of grandeur, to bow and assume the shape of taking the sky's decay on their shoulders, down to one knobby bark encrusted knee, as if expecting the weight thrown down by clouds that will have accumulated in typical mob fashion, royally with an indignation, the color of crucifixion. Another way of saying something entirely different. For a time, I'll just sit here, while the silence here stares with this one gray eye and makes me think that my life is completely ruined the way I think of lives that are not mine and how they are completely ruined. 
I'm sure the sun still shines somewhere else, maybe more so, in brighter colors, causing the people there to believe that it's friendly, even though it's not. And they'll be happy with their garish new friend, even as the sun, or someone directly behind the sun, will be coming up with different ways to defeat them. And then I will end on probably my most autobiographical poem. Self-portrait is a miniature of my father's son. I've fallen in love with a woman so beautiful she can only teach a blind man how to speak. He pays her with gifts of hatching songbirds and ancient woodcuts depicting certain Epicurean scenes. My job is to cause the dead to recall something, thereby making them squirm and turn over in their graves, which helps the earth with its rotation and on a much larger scale gives the sun a greater sense of its own being. Because of my limp, I am able to walk diagonally through walls. On occasion, I like to sit underneath the kitchen furniture in other people's homes and watch them perform in animated scenes unbridled acts of honesty. I know there are those who envy me, whose terrible role it is to live the life of someone they are not, and to do so badly. Right now I am rehearsing the sun's deceptions from a forgotten play on this lovely thin street. The shadows here are wasted because no one sinister is walking out from them. A piano plays to bring down the sun. Excuse me a cello to raise the moon, and planks of sky spoiled by rot and weather are creaking with the weight, God's ever-shifting weight. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it, we did it again. This is awesome stuff. Um, Come sign the book if you like. We'd love to have everybody do that if you can, whoever is wanting to. And thank you, Macy, again for filming us as always. You can't ever leave us. Um, he will post this on the website, on WCTV8's website, and it will also show up on local TV. So. That's right. So next. So the actual deadline is October October 12th. October 12th. Cash and check, which is what's keeping me from doing it tonight. But okay, next month. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you.